and we are live. Hello, everyone. This is Dwight Woods, the Jeet Kune Do Rebel. Welcome to the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues, episode number 280. As you're logging in, if you'd be kind enough to say where you're logging in from, hit the like button and feel free to do so throughout the dialogue. If you're catching the simulcast over on the YouTube, please be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell as well. But of course, the best thing you can do is to share this video and spread the word about the Jeet Kune Do Dialogue. My um, Dialogue partner today just revealed to me that this is his first interview, uh, which is kind of surprising, but I am I am extremely pleased uh, to welcome Ryan Ohl to the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues. He is the author of this big book that we are going to talk about um, at length uh, today. So Ryan, thanks for coming on, man. How are you? Dwight, thank you for inviting me on. I've seen some of your interviews and shows before, so it's a it's a real honor and pleasure to be invited on with you tonight. Um, it's a big book. I have not finished it. Yeah. Why is it so big? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> and the font is so small too. Um, <laughs> well, part of part of it's because I've been working on this since about two thousand nine. So it's it's uh, been a lot of research, a lot of just investigations, a lot of reading and interviewing and things like that. So there's just a, there's just a lot of material that I packed in there. Um, now, coincidentally, I've, we, we missed last Friday. We didn't do an episode because I was in L.A. like I was telling you earlier. But the last uh, dialogue partner was Dr. Conrad uh, Bui, who is also a doctor of um, chiropractic. Oh, OK. Yeah, so I have two. I, I got two of you in a row, and yeah. like I was telling him, I I don't know much of, about chiropractic. The only thing I know about there used to be a joke about chiropractors. Um, there was something about, "Will I see you at Palmer this year?" Does that oh. make sense? Uh, Palmer is the original chiropractic school in right. uh, Davenport, Iowa. So that that's kind of where it all started. Yeah. So that's yeah. kind of the mecca, if you will. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I wanted to talk about essentially, uh, I mean, they're related tracks, but I wanted to talk to you about Ryan Ohl, the author, and then Ryan Ohl, the martial arts practitioner, right? So sure. which, which, which track do you want to do first? We can, I'll, I'll probably start down the road of Ryan Ohl, the martial artist first. How about that? Okay. All right. So, because it, it, it'll kind of all kind of dovetail into one conversation anyway. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll tell you, of course it, it would. So, um, previous to G, what did you do? What was your stuff? Yeah, so, my first martial art books were from my father. He handed me his judo and karate books when I was a little kid from his training. And I don't think he even probably remembers that anymore. But, uh, you know, that that was kind of my first impetus into martial art training. And as a young boy, I thought it was I just I love the body movement, the history, the culture, the, just the aspect of that uh, self-defense world. So I was kind of always interested in the martial arts scene from an early age. I and mean, I tried some different uh, styles here and there. I, I grew up in the Midwest in a, in a small town in Ohio. So it, it wasn't like you had a million options to choose from. Yeah. But. I, I don't remember what year it was, but one day I was watching TV at night and on came Enter the Dragon. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that kind of starts the, you know, the Bruce Lee uh, story. And yeah. like most people, you you encounter Bruce Lee through his films. That's how I feel like most people encounter him. And I was immediately captivated. I was immediately just struck by his presence and his, his movement. Um, and just the, the movie itself was just really cool to me at the time. And and so I just was, you know, really captivated to kind of learn more about that man and just uh, Kung Fu as a whole. Right. And then I think right after End of the Dragon, they had, uh, if you remember John Little's uh, A Warrior's Journey, which uh -huh. is about game, game of death yeah. and all the drama surrounding the footage and just kind of reclaiming that film from what, it, you know, what it had been. And so I watched that, too. And I was just, again, immediately just captivated with his story, his life, his history. Uh, and of course that movie as well. So I, I think I woke up the next morning and I said, I got to figure this guy out. I, you know, I want to learn more about, uh, you know, who he is and, and what he can do. And, and, and as you know, with watching his films and his stuff that he was so good at just expressing energy and just kind of captivating the, uh, the, the screen. Right. Um, and so that, that's really where I kind of started off. I think I got the Tao of Jeet Kune Do from my local library which uh, probably wasn't the best first choice, you know, <laughs> to try to delve right 
in the middle of that. Uh, and then yeah. I picked up his uh, other books and just kind of started from there. Well, so, and, so that's, uh, an, that's an interesting comment that the Dow probably was not the first the first choice. Is that because upon reflection, do you say that because you realized at some point that Jeet Kune Do was not this how to? There weren't really how to Jeet Kune Do books out there. Yeah, I mean that was just the first one I picked, and then I got radically confused right. <laughs> you know, about yeah. everything uh, because yeah. that book is such a scattered mismatch of just of compilations of data, and it's uh, it's just a hard starting spot from from truly from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know you know I started getting like the Bruce Lee, uh, the Fighting Methods books, you know, that were put out in the late '70s, and and then uh, all that kind of stuff. But it wasn't really till I was in St. Louis doing my uh, uh, doctorate training that I realized 10 minutes from my house was uh, in Asano lineage uh, school. Mm -hmm. And so they taught the Jun Fan Jeet Kune Do material. They taught uh, Eskrim Akali and uh, Penjak Salat. And they also had the school um, Bujin Khan Tai Jitsu Ninjitsu. And they had Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as well. And so I started studying with them um, and, and just loved it. Fell in love with the art, fell in love with the curriculum, the, the body movement, um, all those arts. And just uh, that's that's really where my training came from. We're, we're, but this was this was not in 1984 or 85, was it? No, this was in my doctorate training. So this was 2008, 2009. That's okay. when I really got really involved into the, the Bruce Lee training. Yeah, because St. Louis, for those two years, for four years in total, 1982 to 1986, in the summer, um, California Martial Arts Academy, named for the state where the first two camps were held, but it was actually the brainchild of Jay D'Amato from St. Louis. So in 1982 and 1983, he held a camp at U of C Irvine in Orange County. But then in 84 and 85, brought it home to St. Louis, um, to um, St. Louis University, actually, um, hmm. up the street from, what's it called, Laclede's Landing? Is that what it's called? Do you, do you know? I don't know. Do you know yeah Not sure okay yeah so um yeah we, we so we were there so for four years that st louis association with with jkd was um preeminent it was a mm. major camp that um mm. that J, that jay damato uh, sponsored so i'm wondering if if um if any of the guys from the school that you mentioned if any of them were around at that time but anyhow so 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 how long were you there in st louis then well, you know, it's four years of doctor training. Okay. That's how long I was there for. Okay. So I trained at that time. Now, and you said that was 2000? 2000, 2000 uh, let's see, what would that have been? Uh, I graduated four. in the end of 2010. So okay. from there backwards a few years. Okay, so that's 2006 to 2010. So when did the inkling to produce this thing when did that strike you? Right. So I, I realized pretty quickly. When and why? Like, when and right. why? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it's because I was just making notes and I was trying to just kind of compiling things in my mind of what makes up this art and just kind of wrap my, I, I realized that when I get things on paper, I can make sense of it better. And mm -hmm. so I was just writing training notes down and just history as I was learning it and just uh, tactics and theories and principles and just every aspect of it. And I realized I was just compiling a lot of information, plus just my library of, of uh, you know, of all the Jeet Kune Do books and everything, it just started expanding. And I was just kind of right. compiling more information. And next thing I know, I've got hundreds of pages of, of material. Um, and I, you know, I continued to work on that after I left St. Louis, I continued to work on that for, for years up until I published the thing. I was still modifying and editing it up until the time I published it. So it was really, truly, a, you know, a good 10, 15 year project. Yeah. A, a lot of a, a lot of your information was it was I, I imagine it was of the oral transmission variety, right? 
A little bit of everything. I mean, I, I don't know if you notice in the book, I do a lot of citing my sources, a lot of end notes and, yeah. and try to just be as historically accurate as possible. So a lot of that was just from reading and compiling information, but there's a lot in there too that was just passed down to me orally from all kinds of different people, uh, right. you know, from years of, of training. Yeah. Um, but okay. But so now tell us about the, tell us about the why, because I got hundreds of pages of notes too, but I don't think I ever want to try to make sense of them. It would take forever to do that. Sure. Well, I, I think I just got really interested in more the history side of things. Yeah, and, right. and I didn't yes. want to write, I didn't really want to write another like how to be Bruce Lee type book because one, I don't feel I'm qualified to do that. But mm -hmm. two, there's a, there's a million of those books out there already of how to punch like Bruce Lee, how to kick like Bruce Lee. But I wanted something different and unique and something yes. that added more to the conversation. And yes. so I feel like to me, I love history. I love a good mystery, uh, uh, you know, trying to unraveling. Because, you know, when Bruce Lee passed away, there's a lot of things left kind of in the unknown category. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just really love just kind of studying the art and looking for missing clues and things like that. And, and just kind of compiling the history of the system from his beginnings throughout all his evolution to like the final product and yeah. just kind of learning everything in between. And so I, I think that's where that's why I decided to publish the book is because I, I felt the history side of it. I, I felt like I just had enough there to add something to the conversation. Um, you, you, you just mentioned something new and was, so that was intentional to, to find something new, something unique in, in your book. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you what yeah. that was for me. Sure. I had no idea about the Hunga training. Okay. Yeah. 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 So the I don't think a lot of people. Book. I don't think a lot of people do either. So you, you got to tell us about that. Sure. Sure. So the first part of the book, I, I just kind of have the first section, first half of it maybe is just trying to compile what is Jun Fan Gung Fu, what is that progression, what is that art, and then the second part of the book is more of okay let's look at separate systems and how it impacted Bruce in some way or another. And so I, you know, I went through Wing Chun and Mantis and Tai Chi and Hungar and, and all these different arts. And I just did my best to uh, research it and just bring pieces in and just kind of, you know, it, it helps when you're writing on a subject that you've studied yourself, it helps kind of feel it out and kind of go, yeah, I, I remember this. I, I can see where this is coming from. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, Bruce, you know, Hungar was a very popular art in Hong Kong, um, being a Southern style, you know, that, that was just really prevalent, many teachers in Hong Kong. And so he would have been exposed to that through, you know, many different people, not just one person uh, in Hong Kong. And then, you know, when he got to Seattle, that would have continued, um, especially through Mr. Fook Young, uh, who passed away a few years ago. But um, you know, that would have continued. And I, I do think there's elements there. I, um, I mean, I know Jesse Glover said in one of his books that that form that he learned from Bruce, that Hungar form was a required thing. And, uh, you know, they made it very clear. It wasn't just about learning a form. It was study the form, see what it's made of, learn the attributes and pull yeah. anything out of it you can. Uh, so it wasn't just about a demonstration on a stage. It was it was right. something more than that. And, and you know you you can do a form, but then I go through in the book about some of like the iron ring training, um, and just uh, some of the forearm conditioning stuff that I think goes back to that because Bruce saw attribute development, and he saw what Hungar guys could do uh, with you know with their forearms, and he said, "Hey, I, I want that. I want to you know I want that movement. I want that attribute." And so he just yeah. copy and pasted it into his system, and just utilized what they did. So did you, did you, um, cause the, the general history is in Seattle, um, kind of informally, the term modified Wing Chun is what was used, correct? And then now at some point, did it formally become Jun Fan Gung Fu or was that just extracted from the name of the training places? I, I've, uh, I've heard it explained in different ways. 
And I think in the beginning, I think sometimes Bruce Lee would just say, I'm teaching you Wing Chun. And that wasn't really the full story. I think he was teaching his version of Wing Chun, right. whatever that was in the moment. And so that could look radically different in 1959 versus 1962, but he would have called it his Wing Chun. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's one of the things I, one of the mysteries, I guess you could say, that I try to really piece together in the book is because, and in, 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 I'm sure you've heard that term a million times, I've heard it a million times, like what is modified Wing Chun? Uh, because everybody talks about it, but I wanted to kind of quantify it. I wanted to kind of flesh that out a little bit and that's what I try to accomplish in the book is go, okay, uh, what did it used to look like? What did Bruce do in Hong Kong? And how did that look differently in Seattle and beyond? Because that is a history that we need to make sure we don't forget about. Um, but to give you an example, I'm not sure how technical or how in depth you, you want to go. So, oh. you know, <laughs> stop me. <laughs> no, 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 no. Are you kidding? Do it your way, man. Of course. So. So if you think about it, um, like the guachoy, the back mm -hmm. fist, um, you know, that was a Seattle thing. That was an Oakland thing. That was an L.A. Chinatown thing. That was a late stage Jeet Kune Do thing. That that guachoy, that back fist was was there in the art the whole time. Um, but that's not a Wing Chun move. Right. Um, and Bruce Lee and James Lee admit as such in James Lee's 1970, whatever year that was, 1971, 1972 book, the Wing Chun Kung Fu book mm -hmm. that they put out together. They admit as such that that was not part of the original Hong Kong Wing Chun curriculum. So, right. uh, you know, that term Gua Choy does not exist in Wing Chun. It came from elsewhere. And then it's like, okay, well, then where did that come from? Why? When? Uh, why was that incorporated in the first part? So that's one of those elements of the modified Wing Chun standpoint. And, you know, we can look at Jesse Glover's red book is what I call it, because he talks about it. He, he was there to see Bruce Lee experiment with changing things up. Um, and that's kind of the one of the main things I wanted to get across was Bruce was not, he had no sacred cows. He was perfectly fine with modifying anything. There yeah. was you know, nothing left untouched. Any yeah. Wing Chun theory, the centerline theory, the, the stances, the footwork, the hand positionings, all of it was up for debate. And you know he added the Gua Choi in to help himself with trapping and chi sao. That term comes from Choli Foot. Uh, that term also can be found in some other uh, Southern Shaolin style arts. Um, that same kind of movement, uh, Jesse Glover said it was also kind of influenced by Northern Manus because they do what's called a Bung Choi or Beng Choi, which is, means a crashing fist or avalanche fist, you'll see it called. They, they kind of come down with it a little more vertical with it. and. Uh, Southern Manus is another influence. They they use the back fist in, a, in more of that rolling aspect out of a tight movement instead of Choli foot, which is more of a wide arc. And so Jesse Glover makes it very clear, Northern Manus, Southern Manus, Choli foot, even Tai Chi, how they do some of the spinning of the arm in their, in their sets. Right. That was all an influence into one move. And he kind of saw it, how other arts used it put it together as he saw fit, added it to his art, and we've been doing it ever since. I'm trying to find, can you see, that, I, I might have messed yeah. up this picture. Can you see it? Is sure. that the, that's kind of the vertical back fist that you're talking about, yep. right? And that's how Northern Manus would do it. They would trap and, and come down just like that, straight over top. Yeah. Choli foot, you know, they, they will do different angles. Yeah. Um, however they want to strike from. So so I, ju I, I just found that in, um, in, the picture folder that I'm reconstituting because of the laptop that crashed. There is another, probably from that same training session or whatever, there is another photograph of Bruce Lee hitting Jesse Glover with a fist that's shaped like this, like a top of the wrist strike or, or what have you, which I think some people call monkey steals the peach or some, some esoteric name like that. And then there are, there's the photo shoot from there. there I think it was on two occasions, uh, one in Pacific Palisades. It's when uh, Cedro Bruce and Sifu Dan wear alternately the full Kung Fu suit and then Sifu Dan wears the Kempo karate stuff. 
but then there's another one where they're in, they're in short sleeves and, and what have you. But there's a bunch of photo sequences of Bruce Lee in positions that have nothing to do with Wing Chun, right? Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's all over the place. Yeah. I mean, you see Tiger, you see Crane, you see... Uh, Southern Manus, Northern Manus, Chole Foot, Tai Chi. I mean, it's 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 all there, and I and that's really the history side of it. Is re just really fascinates me is mm -hmm. Bruce Lee left no st stone unturned. He investigated everything. He he loved just uh, going through all that material and just seeing what he could find. And I I think sometimes uh, I, I've ran into some people that kind of shy away from that yeah. idea. Yeah, I'm not sure why, but I don't think we need to. I I think we can embrace that research as as you as you were saying that i got the feeling that bruce lee loved the chinese culture he loved you know probably everything about being chinese and chinese culture including the kung fu stuff even if it was a little bit esoteric or exotic i think he's i i, I feel like he still loved it but do you, do you think that at some point he, he had a change of heart, a change of thought, and was like, well, this stuff is cool, but you can't really use it? Is that, hmm. in your research, it, did you come across anything like that? I mean, he ebbed and flowed in his thought process all the time. Yeah. Um, there's no doubt about that. I, I think one thing I would say is he was so fast I, I remember when I would go to some of Guru Inasano's seminars, he would still look flabbergasted retelling a story a story from decades ago of watching Bruce be so fast. And I'm sure you saw the same stories. Yeah. He's still flabbergasted how quick Bruce was. And so when you have radical speed like that, which I think, um, you know, uh, some of that radical speed, I think, was developed through some of that traditional Kung Fu training that he a lot of times kept to himself. But um, I I think because he had such radical speed, he could get around yes. people so at will yes. that you don't that you don't necessarily need some of the movements of some of the, the classical styles. Cause yeah. if, if you can just if you can be the flash and just reach out and touch somebody, <laughs> well, why need all the technique? Right. You, you can just hit them at will, back out, go back in, play with people. And I, you don't need you don't need the trapping you don't need the dissolving and the the grappling because you can just take it from there. Yeah, I heard it said that Bruce Lee could could make mistakes in application, but because he was so fast, you know, it didn't matter if if technically if technically it was uh, it was a mistake. But it, it, I want I want to go back to something you said. I don't want to gloss over this. You just said stuff that he kept for himself or stuff that he kept to himself. I, I have I have a very good friend who is convinced of that. Now I don't have any evidence for it, but I have not written over four hundred pages about Bruce Lee's history. So, sure. as the guy who has written the book, that statement stuff that he kept for himself. Can we talk about that? Sure. I don't I don't know every uh, you know secret there, I, and that's that's really the shame of it is he. When he passed away, he left a lot of unanswered questions. And here we are. Right. Fifth, uh, how many years later? years later. And we're still figuring it out. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, but there was, I'm sure you have, I'm sure you have this book. Yes. Okay. So on page, uh, what did I, I think 24 and 25, there is a letter there mm -hmm. where Bruce Lee writes to Mr. Taki Kimura. And he basically says tacky here I'm, I'm quoting this here are my experiences in gung fu do not let anybody else read it and Taki's uh kind of commentary in that book on that letter says bruce was accommodating me when i asked him about certain books and references that he used to better his martial art training he kept those things very top secret but shared with me on a regular basis and so Taki. You know, whatever Bruce shared with him, whatever books, I think you see some of that later on in that in his book. Well, in, in your book, there's stuff about the Tai Chi form, correct? Yeah. Right. Uh, in the Seattle period, uh, I have it 
you know, right from the horse's mouth, so to speak, from one of the original Seattle students, that the Tai Chi material was required. That, that was required training, um, just like Silam Dao from Wing Chun. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, it's not all about, like I said, it's not just about learning a form for, to look pretty. It's what can we learn from this? What attributes can this develop? You know, can this help with uh, continuity of movement, uh, sticking energies, all these kind of things? So, you know, and, and Jesse Glover makes that really clear in his books that Bruce was using classical forms, searching out anything and everything that yeah. could give him an edge. Yeah. And whether he shared all that information with everybody, I, I think is clear that he was kind of reserved with some people and, and not as reserved with others. But um, to me, and I deal a fair amount with this with the book um, to a point, is Southern Manus is, in my mind, kind of a hidden substructure kind of inside Jun Fan Gung Fu. Um, and you see it come out here and there, but there's a, there's a internal kinematics that I think he borrowed from Mantis that really propelled him to another level of development. Yeah. And you don't see it in the photos. Uh, you can here and there, but I, I think it was that traditional Kung Fu training. I mean, he, he was using that again with Mr. Fook Young in Seattle and, and then other associates too, uh, to literally b- build himself from the ground up to create his own system. I mean, Bruce Lee's martial art, you know, to just take it from the ground up and build a right. fighter. Right. Um, Tell us a little bit about his um, experiences then with um, Master Fook Young. The, the little bit that I know is, and I had not heard, I had not heard about this um, before, the Red Bull Wing Chun, right? Sure. Which is not what sure. Bruce Lee studied in Hong Kong. Correct. There's different lineages of Wing Chun. Um, and I, so I have a chapter on that in the book. Uh, and I, I don't have every little aspect of that memorized, but but through Fook Young, um, and I, I really, I don't want to sound over the top with this, but I really, everything I've researched leads me to believe that Bruce Lee's training with uh, Mr. Young was really important. And that Red Boat Wing Chun that was just so interfused with other arts, especially Southern Manus, Bach Mai, uh, tai Chi, uh, and Bagua. There, there's there's many systems kind of all <laughs> wrapped into one there. Yes. Um, and, and that is true Chinese Kung Fu before World War II, um, before the Japanese occupation, before communism kind of flattened everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we, you know, Bruce Lee was no dummy. He he saw that and he, he knew Mr. Young because Mr. Young and Bruce Lee's father were kind of opera mates in the Cantonese opera. Right. Um, and so Bruce Lee was no dummy. He realized that Mr. Young had a lot to offer and they trained. Um, they trained together quite a bit. And so the Red Boat Wing Chun, it, it looks similar yet different from Hong Kong Yip Man style Wing Chun. And I, again, I'm not an expert in every little detail of what that looks like, but there are similarities, mm-hmm. but there's also radical differences yeah. too. Do, do you remember in, in the book where you, you said, uh, I think it was in 63 when Bruce Lee came back from Hong Kong and told uh, Taki Kimura that uh, Yip Man had been holding out on him? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and that was common back then. I mean, Chinese masters would kind of, I don't know, they, they would be careful with what they taught to who. And, and, you know, next thing you know, well, wait a minute, you never showed me that before. You know, what's that all about? And, uh, you know, you, you feel a little stood up, I guess. But, uh, you know, that was just the way they did things back then. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I've seen uh, pictures of, in Bruce Lee's own handwriting, um, like a, a notebook or, or something titled The Jun Fan Method. And I think I've also seen one, The Jun Fan Method of Boxing. Right. Yeah, he used those terms inter- interchangeably. You you would have. I've even seen Jun Fan Kun Do, which was kind of a predecessor a predecessor term to Jeet Kune Do. He would he would sometimes use Jun Fan Kun Do. Ah. Uh, so you know Jun Fan Gung Fu, Jun Fan Method, Bruce Lee. Me- I mean, it's all to me the same right. thing. It's, right. It's Bruce Lee's style, Bruce yeah. Lee's method, whatever he wanted to teach. 
Yeah. Jeet Kune is not, that is the name of a form from yep. another system, correct? Yeah, that's a Northern Shaolin um, form. You, you'll find it in, it's been kind of uh, preserved, if you will, in the Jing Wu Association or the Chin Wu, however you want to say it, their association mm -hmm. would still exist to this day. They have kept in their curriculum the Jeet Kune form. It's different. The Jeet is a different Chinese character. It, it does not mean to intercept. Ah. I think it means I think it means connected or linked or something like that. Okay. Um, and it's but it's pronounced the same. Um, and Bruce Lee definitely learned that. That can be confirmed. Um, it's in his own notes. There, I've seen uh, one of his handwritten. I'm assuming Seattle curriculums, and there it is in Chinese. It's right there. Yeah. We know he taught it, and we and we know he knew it. Um, but the that form is very much just a kind of a northern Shaolin style. A lot of jumping and kicking, and a lot of uh, a lot of very heavy attribute development, and like just uh, your cardio <laughs> endurance right. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um. Hmm. So, what then is what's your opinion then on? that is Jun Fan Kung Fu completely separate from Ji Kune Do or is Ji Kune Do the continued evolution? Right, you see, so, it, so I, my question is always this. On the day that Bruce Lee decided that his method would now be called Ji Kune Do, did he radically change overnight everything that he had been doing up until then? What's your take? It's funny you say that because I've asked myself that exact same question for years. <laughs> uh, so we're, we're on the same page there. Um, yeah, I, I see it as a progression. Okay. I, I, I see it as a, a true progression of, of his martial progress. And how I see it is... So they say that he coined that roughly January of 1967, I, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, that It's something like that. Yeah. Or July, maybe July, maybe July of 1967. Um, so let's just assume it's July of 67. If you looked at his art in May of 1967, what was the difference? Right. And I am of the opinion there was none. Right. Um, I've heard it said that when, when Jeet Kune Do came around, he started focusing more on the concept of interception, hence the, the term. Mm -hmm. um, and it was something he just kind of kept at the forefront of his mind, uh, the idea of stop hitting and interceptions, but he was already doing that in 1966 right. and earlier in 1967. So to me, it was a flowing progression. It wasn't like this and now something radically different. Yeah. You know, I discovered um, in... It's in the book, Letters of the Dragon. It's a 1966 letter to William Chung and the term Jeet Kune Do is used. Mm. Yeah, but I mm. think, so I think the 1967 July or January or whenever it is, I think that is the first appearance in the daytimers okay. of the term Jeet Kune Do. But I, but I saw it in the 66 letter to uh, to William Chung because he was saying, yeah, he, he was saying. There, there's, a, there's a book. Um, if, let me grab this real quick. I'm going to see if I can, because I think this is kind of to the point of what we're saying. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this handwritten kind of curriculum guide for his art. And it's, you can't really see it very well, but but up here you'll see it says the Tao of Gung Fu. And yeah. then in pencil he writes, oh, the Tao of John Fan Gung Fu. And then elsewhere on the page, up at the top, he writes the Tao of Jeet Kune right. in pencil. And so there's all these uh, you know changes going on, like where he's crossing stuff out and adding words in. Yes. And And what that kind of says to me is kind of what we're saying is he was playing around with terms, mm -hmm. playing around with terminology, but his art is his art. What well, do you think he was playing around, not not just with terms, playing around with ideas right up until July 20th, 1973? I don't know why not. 
Yeah. Um, why wouldn't he? I mean, th this was the aspect of his life that captivated him the most. So why wouldn't he? Um, you know, we, we know, he, I remember there was something, a letter he wrote to somebody that basically he was lamenting the fact of how busy he was making movies and how his Kung Fu training was kind of off to the wayside a little bit. So it, you know, it clearly yeah. ebbed and flowed, yeah. but he, he wasn't done evolving. He wasn't done figuring things out. There's no way. Mm -hmm. He, I don't think he could ever turn it off. Yeah. I, 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 one reason why I ask you that is because I noticed that, um, the phrase latter stage or latter day Jeet Kune Do is coming into more and more frequent usage as, as, as to say that, well, this was the final stage of Jeet Kune Do. And so latter, latter stage Jeet Kune Do is the complete art. That's it. Have you, have you come across that? Sure. Yeah. And I think that's kind of, um, again, with, with my book, I, I enjoy, I think we should enjoy, I, I want to enjoy not just the end stage of something, yeah, but the whole journey. Mm -hmm. And so I understand the idea of, of really trying to learn and know and be Bruce Lee from 1973 and, and you know, do what he did. But uh, one, we don't have his attributes. Um, you know, he was a special guy. Yes. But I also think that sells it short. I, I feel like to me, I get more, we all should get more benefit and more just a richer understanding of his art, his contributions to martial arts, his life, if we kind of understand his art from start to finish. Um, not just solely focused on 1973 or 1972 or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I Because I think it sells it short. Um, yeah. the man, you know, the man passed away. And so we have a beginning and an end and we can, we can use that and study that and see his research, see his, his evolution yeah. and learn from it. Yeah. Um, let, let's, let's do some more author stuff. Okay. People who do not like your book, have you heard from them? No. No, no, I haven't. Okay. Uh, and that's OK. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really I'm not I'm, I'm not really trying to. Uh, it, despite how some of the things I'm saying might sound, I'm really not trying to stir the pot. Right. I'm, I'm really trying to I'm really trying to add an appreciation for history See, and appreciation for Bruce Lee's right. research. But the thing is, if you get involved on almost any level, certainly on the level of writing a book that's yeah. about Bruce Lee a pot will be stirred there, sure. you know, there's, there's no, there's no avoiding it. Okay. So you haven't heard anything. Here's I'll I'll tell you what I heard. Um, sure. The 26 are controversy or non-troversy or mini controversy or whatever. Um, there are people who distinctly say that there were 26 or 27. I forget the number now, 26 or 27 art that went that bruce lee used to compile jeet Kune Do. accurate inaccurate um um a way of looking at it but not exactly the way to look at it yeah i i've wrestled with that list i've seen that list i know mm -hmm. what you're talking about i i've wrestled with that myself i there's no way bruce lee just studied those arts um there's arts not on that list that we know he studied and researched and, and saw. Right. So it's not complete, obviously. It's not a complete list. Um, so I I don't know. I, I think those are arts that he definitely looked into in some capacity. Maybe he sought out a, a teacher or a student in a particular art. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't. Uh, now, if you know the, the back part of my book, I go through quite a list of arts and how that yes. impacted Bruce Lee's art. I'm well above 26. <laughs> yeah. Um, but be that as it may, I'm referring to Jun Fan Gung Fu as a total package, not so right. much just Jeet Kune Do at the end stage. So I don't want to uh, pretend like every art in that list impacted him at the end of his life. Yeah. Um, but it's in the mix. It's in the mix there somewhere. I, I, what I've found is the people who 
um, who cling to that idea seem to be thinking in terms of, oh, well, there was one or two techniques from this art and then a couple more techniques from this art and then some more techniques from this art. So that by the time you're done with the 26 or 27, uh, Jeet Kune Do is now a compilation or a combination of techniques from arts. That's what makes Jeet Kune Do or, or Jun Fan Gung Fu, which I think is ridiculous. It's not about that yeah. at all. I think it's more along the lines of what you've been, what you have mentioned about five times. It's about attributes. Sure, but like I was saying earlier, like we were talking about the Gua Choy, mm -hmm. um, you can you can figure out where that came from based on Jesse Glover and and some of these other men that have you know that saw that training. So um, you can find things you know from arts uh -huh. you know in Bruce Lee's art and kind of go, this is from this art, this is from that art. That is possible to do, but Bruce Lee mixed it up. I know Guru Inasano has talked about that a lot. He mixed things up and blended it. To the point where you can't decipher anymore what comes from what and in the end does it really matter because you know you, you're fighting as a cohesive uh person not yeah. not into segments right yeah um there is a a very popular youtube channel um i won't mention the name because i don't want to give the guy in because the guy is crazy but there is there's a still photograph of the fight scene in Enter the Dragon, and Bruce Lee is crouching down, and the expression on his face and the shape of his hands. Everybody says it's monkey style kung fu. Have you ever? Do you know the picture uh, I'm talking about? I've seen that photo. I have seen that photo. Yeah. Right. It's funny how in the movie you it, you don't I don't know if you really see it very well in the film. No, because there's no so so. so I don't know if there was a camera at that same, there definitely was a still photographer, but in terms yeah. of the finished product, the camera is not on the, in fact, you don't even see Bruce Lee really ducking under that kick that delivered that position. Yeah. But the, the, the guy on, on the YouTube says, yes, this is evidence that there's hidden there's there's other material from that fight scene that was cut out where Bruce goes full monkey style on hand. <laughs> I've never really heard that. I, I I can't really say about that. Well, that's because um, you that's because you have a real life and a real job, so you don't spend time. On it. <laughs> right, right. What can I say? You know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we know Bruce Lee investigated monkey because he investigated everything. Mm -hmm. um, he, he was, you know, in a sense, driven, um, radically driven to just understand it all. Not, I'm not saying that all of those arts impacted him the same way. Right. I think Southern Manus impacted him a lot differently than Bagua, for example, or, or Pick Your Art, Monkey, or Drunken Style. But, you know, um, I, I mentioned like Drunken Style in my book very briefly. Uh, because you know they will they do a lot of interesting thing with deflection and um, body hollowing and just you know moving the body in very unique ways and I guarantee mm -hmm. you he looked at it yeah um, and and at least checked it out. Do you think he would have made a movie with traditional stuff despite what he himself was known for in mm. martial art circles? You think? That's a good question. I. Hard to say because he, you know, he became such a um, a postmodern guy, you know, right. and, and he he talked down so much the traditional styles. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, when he was going back to Hong Kong to make his films, and he would go on like you know he would have different interviews or different newspaper articles, he still would voice his respect and appreciation for the traditional arts. Mm -hmm. um, so I think deep down, I think he realized. Um, you know, he, he was still in that sphere of, of Kung Fu, um, even if he was saying, oh, no, they don't know what they're talking about. I, you know, I, I think deep down, <laughs> right. I think he loved the culture. He, he loved just the, um, the history of the arts yeah. and just uh, the Chinese culture. And there, there was the, um, what's it called? The, the Jade Warrior um, photo shoot. Remember where he's in all the traditional garb? There's sure. Like there's like dozens of photographs of him sure. 
Um, well, and and think about this. He always talked about, oh, traditional weapons. What's the point of that? Like, you know, I'm not going to train in this or that. But uh, he had and he gave a lot of them away to Mr. Kimura. Uh, like he had tons of traditional weapons all over the place. Like, you know, he had broadswords and straight swords and three sectional right. snaps and spears and nunchucks and just everything you can think of yet but yet he says that he has no time for that yeah um, so it's, it's a little bit of like you know like i have a whole box of weapons too hanging up uh just for fun you yeah. know because it's it's a fun thing to know and to learn and to and to train with yeah tell us about your current training mm. i you know, obviously I have a full-time job, full-time husband, full-time parent. So, uh, you know, my, my time for a lot of official training is I'm, I'm mostly retired, I guess you could say. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, I, for a long time there, I did the Inasano, uh, Guru Inasano seminars when I could, I did that for a very long time. Um, lately I've, I have been, um, doing some online training, uh, with Mr. Steve Smith. I've been doing that for a couple of years. Um, and uh, so he he's the inheritor of uh, Fook Young's art. And so I've been training with him um, just to kind of keep my interest in all of this alive. Yeah. And uh, so that's that's kind of what I've been up to these days. And uh, now that the book is done, uh, it's kind of a, a weight off my back <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to finally get that out there. Yeah. Um, Are yeah. there plans for another book? I don't know. I there's more research that I couldn't add into this because it would be 600 pages. Um, <laughs> so there, there is more that I think I'd like to say, or just to kind of think through and think about. Right. Um, but you know, it's a matter of time, as you yeah. know, uh, it, it's a matter you know of time. I, I don't think there can ever be too many, uh, books on Bruce Lee or, or his martial art or, or what have you. I really don't. I really don't. Um, yeah. So, okay, so you've not heard from people who don't like your book. Have you heard from people who do like your book? Oh, sure. I've had lots of people that have just really enjoyed just the compilation. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I have some of the, the Jun Fon and Jeet Kune Do like dummy sets in there and just uh, some of my own um, trapping series and kickboxing series. I, I, I tried my best to kind of compile the art. Yeah. Um, not not that I'm a the you know the master at it or anything like that, but just because I, I don't want this stuff to get lost in the shuffle, right. and so I that you know that's a part of the book is people have been thankful for that. Right. Okay. So well, so that dummy set stuff is another controversial topic as to its origins. Is this a Bruce Lee thing or not? What what has your research revealed? Well, you have the traditional Wing Chun sets and that's all very legitimate. He, you know, did he teach it maybe a little bit differently here and there? Um, like I learned some of the Jun Fon's, what we call the Jun Fon sets, which is just kind of the Wing Chun movements broken up into patterns. Mm -hmm. um, I learned some of that in my training. The Jeet Kune Do sets, I, I really didn't come to a conclusion on that, but I had the material and I thought it was worth cataloging. Yeah. Um, so that's why I put some of it in the book, because I wanted people to kind of see it, to see how it flowed, to see what, you know, what were the movements? What does it make up? Right. Um, so the controversy, I'm not, you know, I, I don't really know, but I, I wanted at least to get the movements out there so people could kind of see what it was about. Mm -hmm. I, I have a similar question then about the, the, um, the kickboxing stuff, right? Um, did your research reveal that to be Bruce Lee material, or is that stuff that was compiled um, afterwards from his ideas? I don't know why it couldn't be a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, because if you think about it, if if you were Guru Dan and Asano or or Mr. Taki Kimura, and you were learning under Bruce, you were probably taking notes, writing things down, right? And then years later, you know, once he passed away, you kind of go, "Oh man, we got to figure this out. We gotta we gotta remember this stuff." Yeah. And then you, you start making lists and compiling, okay, what did he teach? What was his, what was some of the stuff we saw? And you're kind of, you're troubleshooting and you're asking other people you trained with, hey, what do you remember? What did, what would he do with these movements? And then you would start just compiling things because, you know, like I said, the, the man passed away and left us with a lot of curriculum <laughs> and a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of historic material to train to and, kind of just yeah. retrace his steps. So um, 
whether it's made after the fact, it, you know, why not? Why not compile it after the fact? Right. Uh, and that's that was kind of the position I took in my book is yeah. I don't really care uh, who compiled it, but this they say that this is what they did. Yeah. And so let's get it on paper so we don't forget it. I, I, I was going to say he left us with a lot of unanswered questions, but I think he, I think they're unanswerable questions because because he's not around for right. us to even ask, you know? Sure. So I, sure. I, I think it's more unanswerable than unanswered um, questions. The, the um, there, there was, uh, shoot, I, I, I thought I thought of something else and then it, it we, we went off on a tangent and it, and it, it went out of my mind. Um, oh, the Wong Jack Man fight. Your, your, um, your take, your information on that. Since, since that seems to be the radical departure, that seems to be the, the catalyst for the issue of traditional stuff. And now it's all about practical and functional. And so no esoteric Chinese this or, or, or what have you. Oh, I'm not, I'm not so sure about that because after that fight, when he was in Hong Kong in 1965, and I think in February and then later in the year, there's still photos of him in doing the, you know, the updated Jun Fan methods. It wasn't even called Jeet Kune Do then. Mm -hmm. It was still Jun Fan, and he's doing Chole foot moves. He's doing chop choy to the midsection, and he's 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 not doing the the full on Western boxing thing. So, right. um, you know, it was a progression, and you know, he he definitely latched on to fencing and and boxing at a certain stage. He liked that Western approach and that pragmatic. Sism, I guess you could say, and 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 just kind of the Western way of looking at things, and yeah. that can't be denied at all. But I, I don't, um, I don't think it was so much. Uh, well, let me let me say this: like even in the L.A. Chinatown schools, he was teaching sidekicks and hook kicks to the face. He was teaching spinning kicks. Um, definitely not fencing. Definitely not Western <laughs> boxing. Definitely not Wing Chun. Um, and so there's that famous letter from 1965, I think it was July of 65, that he wrote to James Lee, where he says, oh, I'm, I'm starting a new, you know, I'm basically wrapping my head around a new approach. It's going to be mostly boxing, fencing, and Wing Chun. Um, but, you know, even that, I don't think is, um, doesn't account for everything. Right. And, it, and it's uh, just a part of the puzzle. Yeah. Um, is it dangerous to interpret Bruce Lee's writings, his notes or whatever, as it, as the law, this is it, the, you, you know, uh, sure. it, as opposed to, well, maybe on that day, at that hour, here's what he was thinking. He wrote it down, sent it in a letter to James Lee or Taki Kimura, you know, and then maybe sure. a week later, it was like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. Yeah, why not? I mean, people change their minds all the time, right? <laughs> people change their training and, and their philosophy all the time. So why would Bruce Lee be any different? I mean, he uh, in one of the chapters in my book, I, it was a chapter on basically Bruce Lee's, you know, tactics, attributes, philosophies of combat. And I have, uh, you know, quite a bit of material in there. And the, the last section on that is totality of combat, which the idea is, you know, if you're going to be a well-rounded martial artist, but yet you don't know how to kick, mm -hmm. you know, you, you need to look at things in totality. Yeah. Um, how, how do you say you're a well-rounded martial artist, but don't know what to do if someone takes you to the ground. Right. Um, and I think Bruce Lee wrestled, no pun intended. He, he, he wrestled with those ideas of, okay, well, what do I do? If a judo, if a judo guy throws me on the ground, what next? I and mean, what do they, what do I do if they, Put me in an arm bar you know and that's the famous scene with the biting and uh right. fists of fury and all that stuff but yeah. i um i think totality of combat basically gets us philosophically to the point of there are no rules uh and that i think there's a quote from bruce lee where he says efficiency is anything that scores mm -hmm. but yet you know we we read other where other places where he says oh no straight punching yeah. A straight lead, yeah. right? Yeah. A straight lead and and the and the sidekick right. to the knee. That's all you need. Well, that go that goes way back to what you said at the very beginning of our conversation. That sometimes you know, Bruce Lee's. This is not your your exact words, but what Bruce Lee says can contradict. He contradicts himself 
from 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 time sure. to time. And so, you know, think about it this way: if um, let, let's let's pick a movement that breaks the some of the Jeet Kune Do concepts of a straight line, efficiency, uh, economy of motion. Let's pick a movement that co completely drops that on its head. Let's pick the spinning back fist or a spinning elbow. Mm -hmm. If you use that move and it works and you connect with it, uh, Bruce Lee says that is efficient because it scored. Right. And so, but yet that is an indirect route. That is a very, if you think about it, uh, in some sense, an inefficient way of fighting. But if you make it work, mm -hmm. That to me is following the Jeet Kune Do principle of efficiency is anything that scores. And so at the end of the day, I, you know, we have all these rules. Bruce yeah. Lee made it very clear. I, I'm not developing a new style to confine martial artists to a whole nother set of styles or uh, another set of, of rules and laws. Yeah. Jeet Kune Do cannot be another confining system. He said it over and over and over again. Um, and so whatever, you know, whatever that end product was for Bruce Lee, his Jeet Kune Do whatever it looked like for him may not, how do I say this? It, we, we shouldn't confine ourselves to how Bruce Lee approached martial arts because it may not work for us. And we shouldn't be afraid to go, well, Bruce Lee did it this way, but I, you know, I, maybe I'm not that fast or I'm not, uh, I don't have those attributes. I need to fight this way. This is what works for me. Yeah. And to me, that's kind of how we should think about it is uh, what works yeah. for us. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm getting a little bit concerned about this latter stage thing, because if I if I'm understanding it correctly, I got to I got to look at it a little bit more. But if I understand it correctly, it's saying that towards the end, Bruce Lee's Bruce Lee's approach was a limited number of techniques done really well. But that doesn't, for me, that doesn't correspond to totality. How can totality be, well, I got three punches and I got four kicks. And right. that's my complete art. Right. Well, think about it. Like I was saying earlier, if you were the Flash and you had unlimited speed, right. you could do that. Yes. <laughs> and you could solve all martial problems <laughs> with a finger poke to the eye, yeah. with the you know, beauty. But you got to have contingencies for when your beauty gets stopped mm -hmm. and for when you get grabbed around the neck or for when you get thrown to the ground or someone pulls out a knife. Yeah. Um, there's contingencies that have to happen. So what, again, what, you know, if you can, you know, and a lot of that's philosophy, you know, that, that Taoist idea or that Buddhist philosophy influence there, he was trying to kind of, you know, kind of uh, get his art kind of honed down to the bare essentials. Right. So there's a lot of philosophy at play there. Um, and if it worked for Bruce, great. Yeah. Uh, and it may work for you and me, or it may not. And we have to be kind of mature enough and open to the idea of, um, and I, you know, and I'm not trying to step on any toes. I'm really not. Um, but we have to be open to the idea of um, what if Bruce Lee's methods don't work for us? What do we do now? Mm -hmm. and, and that's where the continual training comes in um, and just a, a lot of soul searching. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, because in fact, I had a conversation with one of my clients today that it's never the art, you know, it's not like, oh, well, because a guy, you know, let's say Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is all the rage, right? If you, if you listen to somebody in mainstream media, right? Um, if they go, oh, um, if somebody's training Jiu Jitsu, they're automatically deadly. You know, that's, that's the, that's the rationale. So I was having a conversation with my client. I was like, well, look, what if one kid is a golden gloves champion and the other kid is a white belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? <laughs> you know, I don't know that it's the art. I think it's who's better prepared the athlete or the fighter at the time, you know? So, um, Sure. So, well, let me let me say it this way. Let me just kind of rock the boat just a little bit this way. Yeah. My point is that I'd like everybody to think about what if Bruce Lee's art as it stood in 1960, how he did it, the you know, his moves at that time, maybe that works better for you than how he did things in 1973. And maybe the, the, the you know, the close quarter, the trapping, um, 
you know, influenced in whatever other ways the Chorley Fudd influences, um, maybe that would work better for some people compared to the, the more the fencing style or the boxing style of 1973. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, just because Bruce Lee ended up here in, in that way in 73, right. if his art, if we go, hey, I like this part of his art better, this works for me more, we shouldn't be afraid to use that. Right. That's kind of my, yeah. my point. Hey, um, so when I finish this, Will you come back if I end up with more questions for you? Will you do a part two? Sure, sure absolutely. Right? Okay. There's a lot more to talk about. Okay. So, well, I'm, I'm going to take a few weeks and finish it up, right? Um, yeah. I, I, I love the, the, um, the timeline, right? The Bruce Lee timeline. Um, I mean, you know, now that I'm looking at it, the appendices could have been expanded into their own book, couldn't they? Maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I apologize for everyone that has the book for the small font. I, I, uh, I apologize for that. It, uh, but uh, it, if there's one thing I, I could say is the main thing I'm trying to get across is I think we need to embrace Bruce Lee's history. Yes. The men he learned from his research, his progression, um, it's it's you know I, I think I have a quote in there somewhere. If you want to understand the blossoming tree and the beauty of the tree, understand the root, mm -hmm. understand the trunk, and I think there's a lot we can learn there that should not be passed by. Yeah, uh, because of how Bruce sees uh, how how he looks to us in his end of the dragon mode. Right. But I think we can come to a much deeper appreciation of Bruce, his art, the people he trained with, men like Taki Kimura, Jesse Glover, Guru Inasano. We, we can, James Lee, we can grow in our appreciation for this entire lineage, this, this great art, if we kind of just follow in Bruce Lee's progression. It, it's the pervert, I, I mean, but even, I, I, well, yeah, but those are the guys who studied under Bruce Lee. I think what your book does even more for us by pointing us before yeah. the students of Bruce Lee, the, the, the people from who Bruce Lee learned. So like you, like you said in your notes to me, the proverbial standing on the shoulders of giants. Absolutely. Y you know, he, Bruce Lee wouldn't like to talk about that, but uh, <laughs> he, he stood on the shoulders of, of giants. And I think we need to own that and research that and see that for sure. And, and that is something that should not be left uh, out of our minds. Yeah. All right. Ryan, thank you so much for uh, carving thank some you. time out of your evening. I will finish it. I will make my notes, right? Yes. And then I'll reach out and invite you to come back and we'll talk about it again. Sounds good. All right. Okay. All right, All right my friend. Thank you. thank you so much, man. I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, thank All you. All right. Take care. Bye. Sweet. All right. Um, I did have the thought of asking uh, Ryan to handle some of the comments. I don't look at the comments while the program's running. So, but then I thought, eh, I, I don't think I want to include him in any of the controversy because as you can tell, he's not that particularly interested. So I think I'll go through them myself and I'll respond uh, to anything that, um, that needs a response. All right, so that's it for today. Follow me on Twitter at Dwight Woods, on Instagram at Dwight D. Woods, at paypal.me slash unified MA Miami. You can get the Jeet Kune Do Journey, Volume 1, paypal.me slash unified MA Miami. You can also um, support the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues join, by joining the uh, YouTube channel. Just click on that link and that's where you'll see the different levels of membership and the perks available to you there. And last but not least, you can always support the show at jkdrebel.com. Click on the Rebel Gear link and that's where you'll see stuff like this, the JKD Notables uh, coffee mug available also in garment form. But the best thing you can do, talk about this video, share it, spread the word about the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to turn the computer off and I'm going to go to bed because <laughs> I got to wake up early again and I am still jet lagging from the LA trip. 
but on Friday, 6 p.m., we'll do the comment section. And um, if, if, I get, if I get really good at producing, I might even be able to put up uh, screenshots of the comments that we'll discuss and, um, and analyze and extract and, and what have you, right? Okay, so until the next episode, this is Dwight Woods, the Jikono Rebel, signing off. You guys have a good evening, and we will talk soon. Take care now.